here I am about to start implementing a new feature in an app. This is how it is designed. The screen is going to have two items and then these items are navigating deeply into the feature. This first one is not enabled. We are going to work on that later. But one below is the feature that I'm about to implement. What I'm going to be showing in this screencast is how we are going to create this screen. Now let me switch to the Android Studio. Let me run the application and see how it looks like now. So here I have an emulator. As we can see, we're having a bottom navigation already. We are having this placeholder here and it's empty. And this is how the fragment looks like. It actually opens the screen. This is not full compose application. We are switching the screens one by one and then eventually move to full compose. So for now, we're having the standard jetpack navigation component for doing the navigation across all the other tabs. So we are going to be focusing on this one. So here we are going to create a new package and we are going to start off by introducing a new composable. Let's name it tools view. And we do that because that's how we standardize writing the screens for the project. Also, one of the standards that we are having is that each composable, if it's not a bridging function, should take modifier. And then because this is the screen itself, it should have a state. We come up with a state now. We don't know what are going to be all the things that we will need, but we are going to create a class that will be representing the state of this screen for now, just with some dummy values inside. We are going to change it later. Now we don't have this class. One way to do it is to utilize the studio itself. So by doing alt enter, we are going to just create this class, extract to separate file right away, and we are going to tell it where. And then as a side effect, it does that for us. Now this is usually a data class, but because data class needs to have at least some value. For now, I'm just going to add the val is loading, for example. The thing is, most probably I wouldn't have loading because that page that we're having here, and I don't think it's going to take any loading, but for now, I'm just going to have something to make this data class. One thing to notice here is that this design is what mostly happens in the Android world. We are given iOS design, so we have to come up with the Android. Everything is going to be the same except these tools. It's not going to be to the middle. It will be to the left because the other screens, for example, a community is having on the left. So this toolbar is something that already belongs to the activity. We are not going to change the toolbar. What's important? important is now to reflect this UI here. I'm also going to create a composable, which is going to be a private function. I don't want this function to be exposed anywhere else than this file. And I will need this for previewing what I'm doing. Now this should be enough. I just add a preview. And if I add more previews, I can customize them. So for example, this one can be light theme, which is the default. And I can have a dark where I'm going to have the UI mode to be night yes i should be able to see a preview however this is an empty function here that's why the preview shows nothing so you just put a text here i'll see the text on the preview as well so that works so let's now start creating the screen we're gonna start off with a scaffold the scaffold allows us to actually provide the theme colors and it's going to take in consideration the theming and everything for us so we don't have to deal too much. We're going to just provide here a container color. It's going to come from our theme. We are already having a theme established in Compose here. So I'm going to just use the primary. And as we can see, we are already having background. So what's important for the scaffold is this function here. This lambda here is the content that's going to come into the scaffold. If you open it, it takes the content and this is what we have to provide here and it also provides us with padding value so what we can do this screen i don't think we will need some loading or something we can just directly go ahead and create a column and we are gonna provide we're gonna pass a modifier where we are gonna put the padding values that are coming from the scaffold and now it compiles and another thing is that our first composable here in this tools view is the scaffold we can also pass down the modifier that comes in so whoever calls our tools view is gonna have the possibility to pass a modifier that will actually change how everything in this screen is gonna look. Now it feels like we are good to go with the actual list. These cards, they look like some label, title, or perhaps description. And then we are having a drawable to the right. One way to model it is to create a list of data. Another way would be to card code this, but then most probably we're gonna have additional items here. So it might be less work to consider wrapping this into something like that. So here inside the state instead of this loading let's create a property it's going to be a list of these tools that we are going to be dealing with that are represented here in the screen let's consider what's going to be this tool it's going to be also a data class we can extract it outside of this class but for now i think take of simplicity and to be able to preview it let's maybe keep it here this tool is going to have label 
it's gonna have description and it's gonna have the drawable. In fact, what we can do is drawable rest. So then whoever is creating this class would consider passing a drawable resource rather than any other integer. The compiling tools will tell them they have to pass a drawable. And then here, when creating the state, we could pass as tools a list of, this is going to be the label, this is going to be the description, and we need to pass also the drawable. We don't have it yet, so let's make a to-do here. In Figma, what's great is that we can select this thingy, and it shows here in the assets. Notice how I'm using the developer mode here. So when I select, I see the asset here, and I can download it. In this case, I want SVG. Out of the SVG, I can create vector drawable, and vector drawable section, I can create it once. So I'll just go ahead and download it. I'll just take it to the desktop and extract it. This is my SVG. How can I convert this to vector drawable? There are two ways. I can do that directly in the studio by creating here new drawable resource and passing the SVG. I can create a vector asset here. Instead of clip art, I can select local file. And then I can select SVG. And sure enough, it can create it for me. Or another thing I can do is I can utilize the shape shifter. The shape shifter is also an open source tool that you can use. You can import an SVG. And you can see all the path data. You can make corrections if you need. Also, this is very handy tool when you are working with animated vector drawables, if you need to animate them and so on and so forth. So from this, we can just export vector drawable if we need to. And then you can just copy paste it. And now if I open it, I can see and I look okay. I don't need to change anything. And here I can directly pass. And there we go. So let's, while we are there, do the same for this other drawable. Great. We have both. And then here, we are just going to pass as well this other one. We are good to go. Now we have to do the drawing. Instead of using column here, we can use lazy column and pass the modifier. And now here, we can utilize the items and extension function that comes handy. And here, we can pass tools as an input. It takes in the data, the list of things that you want to render, and it gives me each and every item that I want to work with. From here, I can call another composable that will be representing only that one item. And I'll pass here. Modifier is going to be fill the max width, and the tool should be enough for now. The reason why I am passing these two things before I make this function is that now I can alt enter it and then it's gonna figure out what are the types of the arguments. I have much less to do. Just by pressing enter, it does everything for me. The modifier, we are usually giving a default value. So if somebody else wants to code it, they don't necessarily need to pass modifier on the, only the tool is gonna be required. Back to our design, let's take this card. So how we are gonna structure it? What we can do is we can make this whole thing a row and then inside we are gonna have a column where we are going to put these two and then another element in the row is going to be the image itself. Let's first put the things inside. It's going to be the two label on top, then the description, and then next to the column we are going to have an image where the painter is going to be a painter resource. An ID will be the tool drawable. And then we also have to give a content description that's handy for the accessibility services. In this case, what we can do is we can move the accessibility thing to the row itself. To this modifier, we are going to say semantics. And we are going to say merge descendants to true. So it wouldn't go through each child of the row itself. And then here, we are moving the content description to the row itself. So when the accessibility service comes to this row, it treats it as one item. It's going to read the whole thing. And then inside, we are not going to have this content description. It's going to be null. Now, we have to compile because the Android Studio, at least for now, the version that I'm using and the version that I've used before, when I change something in the resources, be it in the strings, be it in the drawables, regardless, I have to recompile the project to see the outcome. So as you can see now to the right, we are heading to somewhere. One thing to notice is that in the dark mode, the text is not visible. So let's go ahead and fix those little things first. Here, color should be coming from the theme or both. And as you can see now, it is visible. And we also have to apply some styles. 
and we are getting to somewhere as we can see now vertically they are not aligned they are not according to how they should look like one way to do it is to make this row have a vertical alignment that will center the things vertically now they are centered and let's here change so you can have better preview of how these things look like i think it's just fine what if we add padding on this one let's uh, add a background and the background is going to be the car background we need to space them also by 12. there are two ways to do that one is in these items to add spacer height 12 dp that's gonna separate the cards or here we can pass vertical arrangement that's preferable just use whatever feels better for you now in the row what we need to do is make the rounded corners i can click with rounded corner shape now as we can see there is no effect reason why the order of these is uh, something that matters so if i just move the padding up we can see it being applied so now we get to somewhere let's see maybe what is the size so maybe we can just leverage this item and we can say height in 159 is not the best value i usually want to put values that are dividable by two what height in does it's same as saying like what's going to be the minimum height so at least 160 and then if it takes more it's going to expand more then this spacing around this padding that i've added is a padding that is between the parent the actual screen and the card but inside the card you have to add additional padding to move this away and the horizontal is gonna be see how that's gonna look it makes the card smaller so i think we have to make these cards push the text towards the left so there are two ways to do this one is by applying spacing this one we can wrap it into an additional container or because they are both in a row we can play with the weight now if we compare these two they pretty much look the same what we can do next we have this first card is being disabled what we can do here in the tool we can give it also a value and then here, what we can say when we pass to the tool list item, we can make the card semi-transparent based on whether it is enabled or not. We can define an alpha value, which is going to be if tool is enabled 1f, else 0.5f. So this is going to be half transparent. That's going to be the alpha value. And then to the background, we can say, and we have to repeat the same for the other components. And now to reflect what we are seeing here, this one is enabled, this one is not. So let's also do that here because by default both are disabled. This one's going to be is enabled through. And then we have an exact reflection what we are seeing here. Most probably this item, we want them clickable. So what happens on item click and here what we will do is so there are two things we can either make it clickable if it is enabled or not or we can make it clickable in all the cases and then process the click based on being enabled or not the second approach here we can say if tool is enabled then on item click that's one way another way you can say that's going to be our on click modifier and then here we can say then on click modifier so do what works for you and then here we have to pass an on click what happens when we click on an item and that's gonna be a lambda that comes in into the view. I feel like we're having this more or less complete. So the first item, it is aligned to the top. There is no spacing. We have to add also some spacing. So the lazy column does have something for that, which is the content padding. It's gonna be padding values. Now, if I just pass a value, it's gonna apply to all, but I need only on the top or maybe just the vertical. The vertical is gonna be I don't know, 12 dp and as we can see we are having spacing on top we can call this done just open and there we go but this item is not clickable this item is clickable for now it doesn't do anything as we didn't provide anything in the lambda but yeah this is pretty much a reflection of what we are supposed to see the last thing we can do here is we can go ahead and create test i'll just grab this i'll go ahead and create a new package and i'll create a new test so one thing to be careful here is to use JUnit 4 instead of JUnit 5. I remember I had issues setting up Paparazzi with JUnit 5. I had some troubles to set it up, or maybe it's going to work by the time you start trying this. So what I'm going to do is create a test. Before, I'll grab the Paparazzi. 
And all I have to do here is just go paparazzi, snapshot, and then paste the same that I'm having in the preview. I can now go ahead and run this. And it says it is passing, but I don't have any screenshots. What I want to do, I'll open a terminal. I'll run Gradle instead of verify, I can do record. Now this command is going to run all the tests and it's going to make screenshots out of those. And we can save those screenshots each time we run in the CI CD. We can run the verify the debug. That's going to run the tests and make sure that the screens are looking the same. So here in the images, it is generating the screenshots. So you can save these and then each time we call the verify, it's going to tell us if there is a change. So for example, if I go here and if I change this from 32 to, I don't know, 16, clearly there is a change. If I verify now, there should be a failing test. And there we go. There is a failing test and notice how fast they run. This is perfect. And if I click here on this link, it will tell me which test failed and what's the difference. If I open this file, it will tell me what is the difference. There is a plugin for Android Studio that can directly tell you the differences and that works great. There we go. That's how we implemented this whole thing. <laughs>